Hey, Collaborist, I'm Ben Leroy. And I'm Jason Buckholtz. And you're listening to Collabracast. How's it going, Jay? I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, We've had lots and lots of rain, and it seems to have cleared up for the week. It's quite cold here, although I'm not going to complain about cold to a dude who's sitting in madison wisconsin right not now. too bad right here right now <laughs> what is what is not too bad on, it's in, in the mid 30s and that's like for for mid-december mid 30s is pretty pretty tropical okay. it could be it could be below zero this time of year it could be negative 20 it could be all over the place i mean i've seen it all over the place and right now we don't have any snow on the ground to speak of which again is nice because as I get older and I go on walks, I like not having to worry about slipping on the ice or the snow or any of that stuff. So I can't complain about the weather here. Well, mid thirties is down, downright balmy. It looks like yeah. there's some other stuff lined up to to hit the central U.S. That's mid thirties is the low here. So I've you know I'm waking up to frost and ice and all that all that good stuff. Has the I rain? Have, uh, has the rain had a good cumulative effect? Like, is it, or is there talk about like it's helping against drought? I think there's a ton of snow in the mountains right now. And that's always where, you know, with the, the snow accumulates in the mountains and then it feeds the reservoirs. So the snowpack is always a big deal. And this was a big storm in the, in the mountains. So there's some, there's some good snow up there at the moment. Excellent. Yeah. I have a client in Edmonton, Canada, and I heard from her. It was earlier this week and she was sitting up there in 30 below temps. So that's, that's, that's a thing that, that happens out there too. Yeah, it'll, it'll happen. It's been my experience that once you get below a certain point, it just doesn't matter. You get to the difference right. between zero and negative 30 is slight. It's just like, this sucks. This just sucks. I hate this. I hate right. it. It's all it's all outside the realm of human perception. Yeah, it's just, it's just, yes, it's all just really cold at that point, and the differences don't matter much. Yes, I do have a couple of updates in my uh, indie bookstore T-shirt collecting quest. Excellent. This arrived mysteriously in the mail. This is from Word Up Booksellers. Um, the Word Up Community Bookshop in Washington Heights, New York City, which is a little bit north of Harlem. Um, I had to track this one down once again to my good friend Kelly in Florida, who used to live uh, in New York, uh, just outside the city, and worked in Washington Heights once upon a time, where she no doubt came across this little place. It's all volunteer run, and they have community events and things. So uh, if you're in the area of Washington, just across the river from the Yan from Yankee Stadium, which I I realized this morning as I was taking a look at at the maps. Um, and then we also got a note from a listener in Fort Wayne, Indiana, who had good things to say about the Hyde Brothers booksellers. So, awesome. for those of you on YouTube, here is and it's you know who doesn't love a good full colored t-shirt so i've got indiana and washington heights represented i saw hey. that my favorite local indie store here pegasus they tweeted yesterday that they've got shirts back in stock so this is uh looking to be a banner week i'm gonna run over there at some point this weekend so i can get so them represented. so you've got california florida new york indiana wisconsin Yes, um, that may be a uh, main. Okay, so you have That's six of fifty. Yeah, so we're we've right. I've I've passed the ten percent. I've got I'm tr I'm tripled up on New York now. So we're that's it's probably a lot of bookstores in that particular neck of the woods. <laughs> You'll definitely have multiple California ones too, because didn't you get a bookshop Santa Cruz, and you've got your city lights. Yep, but now I got to go get my Pegasus, my yeah. Pegasus shirt. So that's, I suppose, that is to be expected as well. So anyway, I'm going to be well, well clothed in t-shirts 
anyway. Stall the good people while I do a quick bit of uh, looking. Um, where is today's shirt from? Uh, well, this one that I'm wearing is from Word Up Community okay. Bookstore in Washington Heights. The other one uh, that came in this week was Hyde Brothers Booksellers in Fort Wayne, Indiana, okay. which looks super. It's a brick storefront. It looks very old school. Like it looks like it could have been a bookstore in the 1800s. It's a brick storefront. It looks like it's on kind of a main drag. I don't, I don't know if I've been through Fort Wayne. I've driven through Indiana a number of times. Um, I remember Indianapolis. I don't remember going through Fort Wayne, but um, yeah, it looks like the kind of place I'd love to visit sometime. Well, I hope that uh, maybe we can do a collaborative tour of all those. Word Up is on bookshop.org. So for listeners who want to go show Word Up some love, you can buy online. You may be able to buy directly from their website, but I'm just looking at bookshop.org. Uh, Hyde Brothers does not appear to be on bookshop.org. But uh, if you're Let's in the Fort to- Wayne area, yeah, and we go. know at least one listener is, Mm-hmm. Tell them they've the, got they've got um, their own website and will do shipping and and so on. So if you feel like infusing some some holiday budget portion into some local Fort Wayne booksellers, then then Hyde Brothers is your place. So we could just turn this podcast into free advertising for indie bookstores. I'm all about it. <laughs> we can turn it into free advertising for indie bookstores and nonprofits doing good in the world. I will gladly turn the microphone over and keep talking for as long as I can. Absolutely. As both of those things are critical components to community and making the world a better place. And that's what our core mission is. Absolutely. Today in this here podcast, we are going to continue the discussion that we started last week. Uh, I'm, last week, I'm we sorry, talk- I wasn't here last week. I believe you meant Jasper and Bryce were discussing Jasper. it. Big shout out to Jasper and Bryce for filling in for us last week. Uh, we'll maybe see them again someday. Don't know. But yeah, what mm-hmm. were they talking about? They were talking about trusting the reader. They were talking about the relationship that the writer and the reader have and in particular how that translates to levels of detail and and levels of explanation explication description and most importantly the need to resist the urge to over explain stuff to your reader to 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 the the overestimate your reader overestimate your reader assume that they're going to pick up on all your subtleties and they may not they probably won't but but they will get enough of them and the things that they don't pick up on and this is the key thing that we want to talk about today where there are gaps where there are holes the reader's imagination will rush in and fill those out and that really is that cannot be underestimated as a as as really the central pleasure of reading the fact that that there is a world and you it's not your job to create it in minute detail and hand it to the reader to consume this is a partnership between you and the reader where you are co-creating this fictional world of course as the writer it's up to you to have the plot figured out and to have the characters figured out but in terms of the scene building in terms of the pictures and sounds that the reader is going to be seeing and hearing in their mind they get to do a lot of that and you would should create space in your work for them to come in and 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 do that so it's, you're basically helping your reader on a guided dream. We're asking them to metaphorically close their eyes and picture this and then tell the story. And so we're letting them, their imagination, uh, be a part of the creation process. Right. And that's really something that readers are people who love reading 
are looking to have that experience. They're looking to do that. If you want to have every single detail handed to you on a platter, then you watch a movie. And I got nothing against movies. Movies are and can be an incredible art form, but they're very different in terms of the participation that they invite from the reader. And I think that's really one of the biggest differences between those two storytelling modalities is like you said, it's it's a guided dream. You're inviting the reader to come into this and you're saying, I'm going to give you some of this. You do the rest of it, however you see fit. And, and so the experience of reading a book can really vary between two different people. It can really vary in the same person over their lifetimes. If you read a book, I read catcher in the rye several times throughout my twenties and thirties. And every time it's different um, because I'm, I've, I'm a different person. I'm bringing a different imagination into it each time. That doesn't happen with movies. That doesn't, it's, it's of course a movie can hit you differently. The themes can have different meanings as you go along, but really the, the experience of a book can vary a whole lot more. So this week we have a couple of passages we're going to read. We've identified a couple of writers who go about this in very different ways. One of whom we picked uh, is this guy named Ernest Hemingway. You might've heard of him. Fairly famous for his sparse writing style, short sentences, straightforward grammar, not a ton of sumptuous detail. Uh, he's- and yet- still very evocative yes absolutely it, in that his ability to guide that dream is really is you know it's it's so i'm going to read the opening passage of a farewell to arms this is the first paragraph and then you are going to read the opening passage of a different book but let me run through this hemingway and then we'll just kind of take a look at how he evokes the imagination put on my glasses Chapter one, in the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising and leaves stirred by the breeze falling and the soldiers marching and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. Mm. I think that guy's got a future. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think he's a, I think he's onto something there. <laughs> yeah. And while you were reading, I was trying to think of how I would articulate why that stirred something in me and how it stirs something in me relative to what we sort of know and accept and expect from Hemingway. I think I'm that this isn't what we're talking about today, but the music and the rhythms of it, I think are just so unbelievable and engrossing. Um, that's a whole different topic. What I, what I'm struck by, are so the 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 nouns are very unembellished so in that first sentence alone in the late summer of that year we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains he's got house village river plain mountains he's got this whole scene that he creates with five nouns and they're all the most basic form of that noun that you could come up with he doesn't say it's a chateau or a cabin or an igloo or whatever kind of house it might be they're 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 the most simple core generics not the right word but also it kind yeah. of yes unembellished is was it i think the phrase you used and i think that's right i mean there's no adverbs there's no adjectives there's no anything it's just here here are these things Yes, it's, it's even a, oh. even the summer it's not the scorching summer it's not the height of it's just in the summer Right. In the what does summer very, mean to you, reader? 
it's what you know right yeah whatever you know what summer is you bring you bring your own summer to this and if the heat and it doesn't have to be scorching because the heat here at least in this paragraph it's not a factor so he doesn't have to talk about how it's scorching he doesn't have to talk about the lemonade or whatever he's just it's like a good summer and it's a very basic noun but they they invite you as the reader to come in and create that whole scene for yourself based on whatever your experiences are with summers and houses and villages and rivers and plains and mountains. Here's, here's an interesting thing because you said that one of the things that struck you was the music of it, but that that wasn't what we were talking about. But I do think it's instructive to point out how powerful the music of it is without like the tasty lit guitar solo, like shredding and pulling attention to itself. It's it's saying, I'm going to tell you this in the most basic way, and it's going to punch you right in your chest when I do it. And I don't need to do theatrics. I don't need to do sleight of hand. I don't need to throw a whole onslaught of things at you. I'm just going to give you this, and it's going to do it. And I think in my experience, especially with writers who are sort of new and feeling out the writing process and feeling themselves out as writers, people feel compelled to throw in a lot of modifying, a lot of descriptions, because they're trying to show some sort of flair that right here is being illustrated. We don't need that flair to pull a reader in and to be an effective story. Yeah. Gimmicks. Don't need don't need the the flashy guitar solo when when a really solid original chord progression will will evoke. I am also struck by what he does in the second half of that paragraph where he he uses the word leaves four times in the next well there's the sentence about Pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun. Um, and then he, in the next two sentences, he uses the word leaves three times, which as an editor, I would probably flag. <laughs> but it's, I think it's really interesting what he does here in that he picks one. So he creates this whole landscape in the first sentence with a half a dozen unembellished nouns and he just lets that be he's like here you go you can have that and then he decides that he's really going to continue to build this world by just focusing on the perception of these leaves the experience and so he 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 brings in time passing the troops going by but it's all told through the effect that they had on the trees and the leaves so rather than a list of he describes the pebbles in the channel, but then instead of talking about the depth of the forest or all the different types of trees or the way that the leaves are moving or the birds and the raccoons or the, you know, whatever, any, any of the other countless number of details that he could pick out and, and list and describe, he, he decides to take this, what seems to me to be a very artful approach to just like talking about these leaves and some different actions, some different reactions that these leaves have had to different things here. And it's, it is a, it's really just one single detail that he pulls out of this scene to talk about. And he uses that to begin telling the story. And I think that that is, I've, I've worked on projects before where I've, I've been working with authors and working to get this calibrated right the level of detail you should be like you don't have to have 10 details in this scene in order for the reader to fully imagine it and in fact when you go beyond two or three you're really detracting from the other things that are going on like this this scene your plot development your character development at this point is not about listing a dozen details of the room is not going to help move your plot along. It's not going to move your character development along unless it does, unless one of the details is that, Oh, there's a body in the corner, in which case that might be a, a piece of description. That's important to mention. Um, but in terms of selecting details, 
this is one approach and this is something that we're not advocates. So the other, the other example that we're going to read kind of does the opposite of this. And it is a, a very acclaimed author who we are certainly not going to criticize the effectiveness of his work. Um, but we would love for listeners to consider these two different approaches towards detail and consider what they mean in terms of the dialogue that you're having with your reader, with your reader's imagination. In this case, I just think this is so beautiful and effective. And that that decision, that that technique of selecting that one detail to really focus on and and to track that single detail over time really begins to tell the story. You begin to see these troops and understand that there's conflict that they're passing through that they're gone that there's time passing that things are changing there's geopolitical things happening that you know we don't know about yet but we understand the context i um, wanted to go back to something that you said that's worth revisiting both as an editor but also as a writer you mentioned that he used the word leaves three times in a row and that you would have flagged that and i probably would have flagged that too if this were a client who had come to me and handed this to me, there's the adage about you need to know the rules of writing before you can break them. And I know as an editor, I have it locked into my head, like here are the rules. And I hate the fact that I have that. And I think that it has stunted me as a writer sometimes. And it's made me engage with, text that I'm editing in a different way. But there are rules. There are things that subconsciously trigger the red flag uh, action as an editor. And like Jason said, if I saw a word repeated three times that close together, I'd be like, come up with something different here or, or reframe this. But then when you see how effective it is, you say, oh, this was a very intentional thing. This wasn't because it was sloppy. This wasn't because the author couldn't come up with another word. This is because the author chose to do this precisely as it was done. Now I have to re-engage with it and say, okay, if I ignore the rules that I think I know, and I say someone is telling me this intentionally, how does this hit? And it hits very effectively in this particular instance. And so it's good for me in an editorial capacity to examine some of these things. And I'm glad that you pointed that out specifically, because there are times where something is wrong and the same exact thing is genius. It's just a matter of, did you do it intentionally and did you understand what you were doing? Absolutely. And I think that this that the success that he has in this, it goes back to that music. It's a, reading those lines. There's so much music in them that a repeated word is it, it, it's that happens in music. You repeat phrases, you repeat, you know, you, you've you got um, variations on themes and and he is doing that masterfully all within in the span. of. I'll, I'll read the sentence again. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusty, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising, and the leaves stirred by the breeze falling, and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. That's, I'm going to have to read some more of this book. <laughs> it's been a while. should check in with him, see how his career is going. I should, yeah. See if, he, see if he's looking for an editor. Yeah. This is a... Um, I mentioned this to you before we hit record, but this is the, a, a 1929 edition of uh, a farewell to arms that I have here. And it, it, it smells amazing. Um, your, you talked about breaking the rule, needing to know the rules to break them. And there was in, in, uh, in an Instagram comment discussion, we had that reel about head hopping and uh, omniscient third person and a number of people who saw that put in the com talked in the comments about people who 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 do that successfully. Especially Dune popped up a whole bunch of times. It did. Um, 
one one noteworthy was uh, a noteworthy comment was on Virginia Woolf doing that as well. And I responded and it was, I, it was, it's the same conversation. It's like, yeah, well, when you, when you can write like Virginia Woolf, you can take these rules and bend them to, to your will. You can, you can make these do whatever you want to do. Um, and again, it all, it relates to, I, I don't remember what it was about, but I remember writing a paper in my uh my mfa program about this same thing and talk and comparing it to a jazz musician and the improvisation of a jazz musician and and how in order to really be a master of that you have to get all of the theoretical and classical education down you've got to know all of those rules and then you can go and and break them deliberately and purposefully and for a reason and that's really the difference. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a passage that you're going to read. You want to introduce this next author? Uh, we've got Don DeLillo's White Noise. This is the opening paragraph. The station wagons arrived at noon, a long, shining line that coursed through the West Campus. In single file, they eased around the orange I-beam sculpture and moved toward the dormitories. The roofs of the station wagons were loaded down with carefully secured suitcases full of light and heavy clothing with boxes of blankets, boots and shoes, stationery and books, sheets, pillows, quilts with rolled up rugs and sleeping bags, with bicycles, skis, rucksacks, English and Western saddles, inflated rafts. As cars slowed to a crawl and stopped, students sprang out and raced to the rear doors to begin removing the objects inside, the stereo sets, radios, personal computers, small refrigerators, and table ranges, the cartons of phonograph records and cassettes, the hair dryers and styling irons, the tennis rackets, soccer balls, hockey and lacrosse sticks, bows and arrows, the controlled substances, the birth control pills and devices, the junk food still in shopping bags, onion and garlic chips, nacho thins, peanut cream patties, waffles and kabooms, fruit chews and toffee popcorn, the dum-dum pops, the mystic mints. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. So got obviously a, a very different approach here. Yeah. And we got a lot of itemized specifics is how I would I would term that. But it very much drew me into the scene. And with each one of those things that I read, I thought about my relation to them. Um, I thought about what it would be like to hold a tennis racket, even as I'm just saying it, like I was just imagining that I was thinking about what hitting a ball with a tennis racket feels like I was thinking about my lack of association, but curiosity with things like the Western and English saddles, like not I'm not someone who has had any experience with either, but like it, it brings up this whole like, yeah, but who is the student that does or the student who does. And so I think about that and I think about what do I know about what these objects mean in the general culture to who I might find using them at any given point. And so I'm starting to think like, is this a fancy prep college? Because I'm hearing things, I'm asking myself, what time period is this happening in? I'm thinking about things like phonographs and cassettes that when they were contemporary, people would be like, yeah, that's the standard thing. But I get a little wave of nostalgia when I read that because it's part of my youth and not so much my present. So it, with those itemized things, even the dum-dums, like the, just, I think about the Elmer's restaurant that I go to in Portland and they've got a big bowl of dum-dums when you're paying for your bill and you you take a dum-dum and so like there were all of these triggers that I could relate to my own world which was different than the Hemingway and the river and the mountains I don't have those as my backyard is the way that the narrator was sort of spelling that out but all of the things in the beginning of white noise I have some sort of relation to or I can conceive of some relation to I, I had a very similar experience. And, and for me, it was, you know, when I, 
as you were reading that passage, which is it's a very famous opening. This is this was a highly celebrated book, and for good reason. Um, I first read it in a comparative literature class as an undergrad at UC Berkeley. And so I, I came across this as a college student. So it was very immediate. And it's, I, I've, I've had my, my reaction to this sort of writing has not been consistent over the last quarter century since I first came across it. I've, I've kind of gone back and forth on, on my feeling about it. But now I, I thinking about it, hearing it again, revisiting it, I'm really finding a new appreciation in what he's doing. So this list, it, it it's a way of, I, I think that he really paints or pursuant to our topic here, he allows the reader to come in and create an image of so there's he's not leaving anything to our imagination in terms of the contents of these cars we you know even the light and dark or what is it light and heavy clothing like he's talking about different weights of clothing he's talking about very specific um piece it's not just sporting equipment it's not you know it's it's very specific in terms of of what he's talking about so he's leaving nothing to the imagination in terms of the contents of these cars but where what your imagination comes in to do then is to extrapolate to who these kids are, like where, what time it, what, what, when, what year is this? Where in the country is this? What is the, you know, these are, these kids have a lot of leisure time. There's a lot of recreate, you know, there's, they got their sporting gear and their drugs and, and, and all that. And so there, you know, this is an upper middle class type place um and and i think that it it really goes a long way towards building this whole the whole surrounding world through these very specific lists of of things um it also says it, there there's also it, it it has its own music it has its own there is a, a different type of deliver, delivery. There's a, a different type of music. And it's almost, for me, I think there's a real commentary about materialism and the modern world. It almost reads like like a, a spreadsheet. You know, you could you could you could write this passage in Excel. You don't even need Word for this. Um, these these lists of things. Wow. And, I, <laughs> yeah. and I and I think that that says something about that contributes to the feel it contributes to the reader's experience of of not only the world that he's creating but also his attitude towards it or the the narrator's attitude towards it you know there there is some satire here there's some tongue in cheekness there's there's a little bit of a you know it's it's not where 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 hemingway's passage is non-judgmental like it is like here's this here's this world and and you know if there's any type of subjectivity in it it's it's the selection of the details that the character is perceiving with the dust and the leaves in this case you feel that the the, the narrator's decision to really focus on these things is a commentary in itself about this world the 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 owners of all of these things their parents the society that they live in and um for those who haven't read the book that really does play out through the narrative but um yeah it's just there's just so many interesting decisions there that that and, and even though on the surface it seems to take the opposite approach of Hemingway in that it leaves very little to the imagination it actually points to all these other sorts of things that you can begin to imagine I like the idea and I want to explore it maybe in a future episode of the podcast. The idea that you said of you can write this in Excel and not Word and, <laughs> and still find the music in it. Cause I could my my immediate thing was like, okay, what if I had a grocery list that was in Excel? And it'd be like white and wheat bread, tomato soup. Like it, you could like you could make that musical. Yeah, absolutely. I got yeah. my brie cheese, my cheddar cheese, my American cheese, my craft cheese and macaroni. Like, like you could, <laughs> you could sit there and do that. Yeah, you could. I mean, I'm sure there are probably, you know, if we were 
poets analyzing that paragraph, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure we'd probably uncover other things to talk about in terms of his, the particular details and the order that he chooses to share them in. But um, yeah, it's just, it's a very different approach. Um, but, and, and very, very different invitations to the reader in terms of what their imagination can, can come in and, and participate in and, and create. So just wanted to share that with everybody. So as, as you're writing, think about the invitation that you are extending to the reader. Think about the, the interplay between the story that you have thought of, that you have spent so much time crafting and creating and editing and rewriting. And, you know, there's a certain negative space and positive space thing going on here where no matter how sumptuously you describe something, there are gaps that the reader is going to come in and fill and, and think about, think about where that line is and think about how much you are want to invite the reader to participate in those things and think about your decisions, your decisions to include or exclude details and how relevant they might be and why you're putting them in there and, and how much work they might be doing. And in addition to the environment, or in the case of white noise, the contents of packed into the station wagon. I think it's another place to think about this as far as your characters go. I am notoriously thin with describing my characters. And I've definitely read a lot of books where people are really, really, really descriptive of their characters down to every single detail. And there's, I don't know if people have noticed it, and it's changed a little bit in the last decade. But for a while, the conventional wisdom in the publishing industry was you didn't put faces of characters on the front of a book, on the book's cover, because you wanted to let the readers determine what these characters look like, who they were, how they how they look together, et cetera. And I know that romance as a genre certainly has a lot of characters on the cover. And I think just sort of loosely speaking, I think I see that with sci-fi and fantasy too. But for uh, for the majority of my time in publishing that was working around crime and was working around literary fiction, that was just a sort of an encouraged no-no is that you did not put actual photographs of people on the covers to represent the protagonist or the antagonist, et cetera. And maybe I sort of gravitate towards that being correct conventional wisdom because that's how I approach it as a writer too. Like I don't even see my characters. I think I was talking about uh, one of my paintings last week. I'm sorry. I, I believe Bryce was referring to one of my paintings last week about how seeing paintings and understanding these people to be characters or to be representative of characters and the paintings are not hyper realistic was enough to like make people realer without defining what they look like in in anything but the broadest sense and that that's an important part for me a lot of book covers i saw there was an instagram reel that someone passed my way of somebody making fun of the number of book covers these days that are the backs of people there are like, I think he goes into a Barnes and Noble and he's, he's taking video of, you know, the new releases, hard, hard backs and, and a great many covers are, are women walking away. So you yeah. see, it's like, it's about a person. There's a scene there's, but there's no face. Yeah. Um, I would say about romance. Maybe, maybe there is a, an exception there because there's not a whole lot of variety in in the romance novel protagonist <laughs> casting. There, there's there's kind of one type of you know. There's just it's not really an equal opportunity um, type of of position <laughs> in terms of body types, age. You know, there's it's, it's, it's probably it's, skews towards like the hunkier, gorgeous, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's. I think it's an yeah. interesting consideration. So you know, it's it's it, it, there's a very very specific type of 
romance I'm, novel hero, hero slash heroine. So I'm 100% sure that there is a listener or viewer of this podcast right now who works within the romance genre, who is pulling out their hair right now and saying, you don't understand the genre to both of us. Um, and I hear you and see you person who's pulling out your hair. I I think there's a lot more nuance to the romance genre than people on the outside give it credit for. And so uh, I, I think at the same time, you're right that there's this sort of like, super optimized version of the aesthetics of a person that is sort of inherent in the genre as I understand it and have had interactions with it. And um, yeah, it's, it's worth, it's worth a deeper consideration, I think. And the same thing with like sci-fi and fantasy to me, like here's an orc, here's an elf. Like I don't, I don't know how to contextualize these things without a visual representation sometimes. It could also be that, you know, regarding romance covers, you and I both grew up in the era of the era of Fabio. Yeah, so that probably, absolutely. That probably 100%. something to do with <laughs> 100% with our, our, our takes on it. I would say that the amount of dudes with like rippling six packs uh, on cover art is significantly greater in the romance genre than any other genre. And significantly greater in the romance genre than in the general population. I think, I, I feel like we can, I feel like we can say that with, with not, even though neither yeah. of us has worked yeah. extensively in, in that genre. I, I, I feel like that's a non-controversial statement. <laughs> yeah. Shredded dude. Uh, I don't have anything more to go on this topic. How about you, Mr. Buckholtz? I think that's a wrap. All right. Well, if you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to rate or review wherever you get your podcast. Tell your friends. If there are certain subjects that you want us to cover on future episodes, send an email to info at collaborist.org. I sincerely hope that as we approach and uh, survive the holiday season that you all have a wonderful time we will continue to be putting out episodes and uh yeah again i just want to thank bryce and jasper for filling in last week and that's it for me mr buckholtz for story for community collaborators